So hello everyone, my name is Alfred uh, from Hungary, Alfred Szilágyi, and I'm going to present you um, a case study from last year that we carried out, uh, which was about pollinator communities and agrobiodiversity in uh, different farming systems uh, on different farms in Hungary. Uh, first of all, I wanted to highlight that, of course, this was a teamwork. Uh, so the, the other contributing authors was uh, Fanny Mészáros for her. This was part of her thesis work. Uh, Robert Kuhn had me with the statistical analy analysis. And uh, Miklós uh, Sáros Pataki was basically the professional background. He's a professor from our university. Uh, and his main uh, expertise are pollinators and bumblebees, basically. Um, the other thing that this, uh, uh, this case study, uh, this pilot study was part of my PhD research work uh, for which my supervisors are Esther Kovács and Csaba Centeri. Uh, and thank you Pablo uh, and also Joanna for, for uh, organizing this conference and giving me the possibility to present this online. So first of all, I wanted to set the context uh, of, the, uh, of this pilot study, which was my PhD research, um, uh, uh, during which I, I look at uh, sustainability and ecosystem service provision at farm level. So I'm trying to compare the two different approach uh, and also to, to, to find the linkages somehow integrate the two. Uh, and also to carry out on-field uh, on field studies or uh, measurements. And uh, because my initial idea uh, was that uh, if we go to farm level um, and we're trying to, to assess these things, then basically we need the same proxies. We need to measure the same things on the field. Um, and this is why another aim uh, uh, is to, to, to evaluate the different indicators and methods that have been so far uh, applied to assess these, uh, these concepts. Um, and uh, the other big aim is to compare farming systems, so these conventional organic and permaculture farms. Uh, and uh, a latent future aim uh, is to set a scientific base for a permaculture assessment method which I, I, I really hope that could give a, a base for a certification scheme in the, in the future. Um, so as I said, this pilot study with this, our main aim was to, to evaluate the sampling methods on field uh, besides just uh, having the results. And uh, we are really looking at uh, a lot of things. So like soil quality, specifically uh, on humus content and quality also on soil biota um, and agrobiodiversity uh, or biodiversity on uh, with a with a vertical focus so uh, below ground we are looking at earthworm uh, uh, population and nematodes uh, on the surface on the soil surface we, we put also uh, we use pitfall traps and we're trying to look at that as well uh, and above ground we are looking at the pollinators which i'm going to present here the the, the results and also we are looking at decomposition capacity and trying to set up a carbon balance for the farms and habitat quality and the biological control of pests by natural enemies. So, but here in this presentation, I will just uh, focus on pollinators and agrobiodiversity. Um, so a little bit of introduction. Uh, what do I understand uh, on the different farming systems? So on the conventional farms, I understand uh, those farms which uh, which are really heavily synth uh, synthetic input based. And uh, unfortunately, or well, uh, so the main aim of, the, of this farming is, is besides growing food, is really to, to, to produce profit. While um, uh, on organic farms, I understand the, uh, the certified organic farms, uh, which is regulated and described by law. And on the permaculture farms, um, I understand those farms which go beyond organic farming principles, and it is really nature-based, focused, and uh, and they have this holistic attitude. We know that permaculture is more than just farming, so really this holistic approach. Um, and why pollination? Uh, why they uh, uh, pollinator? Pollinators have quite a significant role. So 
87% of flowering plants and 75% of the cultivated crops need pollination. So without it, we, we will really run out of food. Um, and uh, this is, of course, nowadays this uh, the the serious decline of pollinators and uh, and honeybees uh, is a very hot topic. Uh, and also ecosystem service in the in the field of ecosystem services, pollination is one of the most cited and discussed ecosystem service. Um, so the research questions uh, were first of all that on, in which of the studies uh, studied farms do we find highest abundance and diversity of pollinators uh, and how the agrobiodiversity affect the results and finally going in the background like which are the key elements of agrobiodiversity which which patterns can uh, can be observed regarding the pollinators the, the, the results. So here is uh, Hungary in Europe, and uh, on the right side you can see uh, the Saint Andre Island, where where we uh, determine the farms. Um, for the farms, we had uh, the, uh, the the following selection factors. Uh, we we needed similar size farms, so these are about these are small scale farms around one to two hectares. Uh, with very similar agroecological features, so soil and uh, climate conditions are very similar, and uh, all of them have diverse horticulture production. Um, and just to just to um, give you a brief uh, uh, point, so these these points the, uh, the uh, which are indicating the farms on the right side here. So these farms are like uh, three kilometers from e uh, each other. So uh, we really wanted to have a sample which is comparable. And now some pictures. So this is the permaculture farm. This one is the conventional farm that we studied. And this is the organic farm. So for the pollinators, we used the visual sampling method, which meant that uh, two of us, uh, we uh, divided the, the sites into two parts and uh, we did the sampling for 30 minutes. Uh, so all in all one hour for two of us. And we did that four times in the year. Uh, and we registered the, um, uh, the pollinator, the individuals in 14 different taxonomic categories. And uh, we only registered those individuals which were on flowers, so visiting flowers. Uh, as for the agrobiodiversity, use a simple uh, uh, mapping method. We went out with a printed paper map and uh, we, we delineated the, the parcels and registered the different uh, cultivated crops. We did that in three times, uh, but uh, here I will just uh, show you the maps from July because that was the time when it was most diverse, the, 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 the different crops. And uh, for the data processing, we use the Excel software and then the R software to, to uh, analyze the results. Okay, so these, this is the overall results of the abundance. Uh, so the frequency of pollinators on the three sites. So you can see that um, uh, permaculture farm had the highest frequency of pollinators. We registered more than 200 pollinators during the year while for the conventional farm, it was only around 100. So you can clearly see that the organic farm, it, it fall in the middle, uh, but the variation was highest in case of the, poly, uh, of the permaculture farm. So this is the overall result, but we will uh, look into more details. So here are the, the, the bee, bees and the, uh, the results of the bees. Here you can see the honeybee, uh, so you can see that the, uh, we found uh, uh, the highest abundance of, of honeybees in the organic farm. This is the bamboo terrestris, the bumblebee. Um, in, uh, uh, here we, we found also most of them in, uh, at the organic farm and you can see that the permaculture and conventional is quite similar. Uh, the results are quite similar. Um, and here, this is also a very interesting group. This is the other bees, and uh, most of the wild bees were here. We registered here, and um, <clears throat> and you can see that in this group, the permaculture farm had highest abundance. Uh, 
Uh, and here is the, uh, the summary of the bees. And you can see that the organic farm had highest abundance of bees in all and conventional had least. Um, and here you can see the, uh, 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 the butterflies, uh, butterflies uh, the fr frequency of them. And you can see that the permaculture farm and the conventional farm had quite similar results and why the organic was, was some, uh, qu quite substantially lower. And here are the hoverflies, that was also a category. And uh, here the, uh, at the permaculture farm, we registered uh, the highest abundance while the least at the organic farm. Um, so we also tried to <clears throat> look at the diversity. We had to form functional groups because as you see, we didn't register the, uh, the, the, the separate uh, the individual species. So, so we formed functional groups and you can see here the Shannon diversity, here on the right, the Simpson diversity. And you can see that uh, the permaculture farm had a slightly higher uh, uh, result, which means better result but it's not a huge or major difference. Um, and here is the number of functional groups uh, in, in the farms and the evenness. So if we look at the diversity, this clearly shows that there was not a, a, a huge difference. But this, this, is, this is all the results, so this is not separated uh, or distributed to the different times. And uh, here are the agrodiversity maps. The first here is the permaculture uh, farm. You can see the different crops. Our initial idea was to indicate the different crops with different colors and the different families, but as it was in Hungarian and I had to translate it into English, that's why it's a little bit uh, mixed up now. But you can see the, the size of the parcels and also the different crops here. Uh, and uh, here is the organic farm. Uh, and here is the conventional farm. And uh, if we uh, go through once more, uh, what is the trend or patterns that uh, you should look at or should observe is, is the parcel size and also the diversity of the crops. That as we go from the permaculture farm to the conventional farm, you can see that the parcel size is increasing while the diversity of the crops is decreasing. Uh, so this is the organic and this is the conventional where you can see that one third of the, of the site was cultivated with potato and one third, another third was with cabbage family uh, and only the rest with the, the other, other uh, uh, crops. But still, it's, it's, as you can see, it's a quite uh, diverse um, uh, uh, production. Uh, so a summary of the results, uh, as I said, the highest frequency of pollinators were recorded at permaculture site and lowest to the conventional farm. Butterflies and hoverflies were also recorded most frequently at the permaculture farm. Uh, in case of bees, the, the, the circumstances seemed to be best at the organic farm and least at the conventional. Um, and pollinator community was most diverse in the permaculture farm, but it seems that there were no major differences among the three sites. Um, and I wanted to show you the key elements and patterns. So what we observed that there, uh, so increasing biodiversity uh, or agrobiodiversity doesn't mean necessarily or automatically that uh, the increase of pollinators, because there were some key crops uh, that really uh, contributed to these results. Uh, the first was the cucurbits, so squash and uh, uh, zucchini. Uh, these were all uh, very uh, popular for the pollinators. And then sunflower and uh, Yerushalayim artichoke was also mostly for the bees. Um, and then in case of the conventional farm, why these results came out, why the conventional hadn't have lower diversity was because of the ornamental plants. Uh, there was statis, carnation, and, uh, and uh, an ornamental uh, uh, sunflower variety. And this really contributed to the, to the, um, to the results, and gave the results. And that's where we registered a lot of pollinators. And, uh, also, what we uh, what we observed is the is the role of the weed flora. 
which was really uh, important, uh, at least in May and July, not in September, but, uh, but what we observed that uh, a diverse flowering wheat flora were at least so important as the cultivated crops. So we, we somehow saw that the pollinators, they really came to the, to the weeds, uh, to the flowering weeds, and then if they were already there, then of course they pollinated the cultivated crops, but they preferred the, uh, the wheat flora. Um, uh, the other interesting thing was the cover crop mixtures, uh, which, uh, which they applied at the permaculture farm, and, um, uh, and this was also very, very uh, beneficial for pollinators, besides the other aspects like soil and, and things like, or for water uh, or whatever. Uh, only if we looked at the pollinators, it was really important. And also because uh, they were flowering, this was a mixture and there was Fatsalia, Tanatsate folia in it, and uh, also some different other uh, uh, flowering uh, uh, plants in it. And uh, and and it uh, it uh, it's already in May at the early May it was flowering so it it, it was very good to 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 uh, increase the duration of flowering plants during the season uh, and the last one was the the herbs and spices and just to show you these in pictures uh, so you can see the sunflower on the left the cucurbit. This was a zucchini uh, a flower in the middle, and um, here are some herbs, some weeds. Uh, also here the the, uh, the the that was also some kind of herbs. Uh, but here there is a there is a pepper plant, and you can see the uh, the pollinator on the flower. Okay, so what we can. Uh, uh, conclude as recommendations from our observations. Uh, the first and maybe most important that we, we were thinking of is this kind of, there should be a conscious weed management. Um, so instead of just trying to kill all the weeds, either chemically or, or, or physically, um, which is either uh, in itself a big task, but uh, um, we are not sure that we have to get rid of all the weeds uh, and uh, because at least for the for the pollinators it's really not beneficial so instead of this we 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 really uh, recommend to somehow to to manage the weeds in a way that it, it doesn't make too much damage but still uh, but still you could have it there for example if you cut when they grow too uh, too big then you cut them and then they can regrow again, uh, ref, uh, flower again, which is also very beneficial uh, for the for the um, uh, pollinators at the end of the season. So, um, so this was one thing. And um, the ornamental plants was really interesting in the in case of the conventional farm because you can see that it ha it had uh, it had one purpose, you know, to 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 um, so they they could sell it on the market but still it has these uh, different other functions. So, so I think it's a good tip uh, that uh, farmers can think of to integrate ornamental plants. Um, also, this is true for the cover crops. And, um, and finally, uh, to increase the agrobiodiversity on parcels, I think this is very important. So not on site level, we have to think also, if we are thinking with kind of with the head of the, pollinators, then we have to go down to the parcel level, not to the site level or farm level. And, um, and uh, how we can increase this, for example, with companion planting, this is uh, something we saw also in the practice. Uh, and of course, polyculture, which this conference is about, and maybe some, uh, I put in the bracket, but uh, the integration of perennial plants like agroforestry and forest gardening, I think can be also a meaningful tool to, to, to help the pollinators. Um, and, uh, and the final remark is the patchiness. This is also linked to the parcel, that it is very important, the parcel size uh, and diversity of the different crops, like, uh, like as you could see with the potato and the cabbage family at the conventional farm, it really take, took up the, the almost two thirds of the site. So the, um, 
uh, the distribution of the different cultivated crops is very important. Um, and finally, uh, some future research aims and ambitions of us. Um, so you could see that, uh, that the, these preliminary results are quite promising. And uh, based on that, we, we would like to, to look at the attitude of the farmers, not only on the side, but also the farmers that how and why do they do uh, um, this kind of farming. Also, uh, we would like to look at the, the affecting factors. So besides agrobiodiversity, uh, we, we looked at the adjacent habitats. Also, we want to carry out interviews with the farmers uh, regarding the farm management, like for example, pesticide use and things like that. And um, I also have to uh, stress that this is only a case study, so three farms. So we want to carry out research on more farms this year, probably five farms uh, per category and uh, to have statistically valid results and uh, trying to um, uh, take this to the, to the agriculture system level. And, um, and the final thing is um, what I want to stress is it is very good uh, that we measure something on the field so this kind of biophysical biodiversity indicators, this is very important to go out on, go out on the field. And at the first level, we should interpret this to the farmers. I think that's very important. Um, but besides, uh, we also have to interpret it on the level of, of ecosystem services and sustainability, because this is what the other scientists and also I think decision makers and, and society can really understand. So. Uh, this is where we would like to take uh, this research to this this level. So thank you for your attention. And um, if you if you are interested for further info, please email email me through this email address. And I'm looking for your questions.